Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Massoni from the Film Society of Lincoln Center. And on behalf of the Film Society and the Museum of Modern Art, I want to welcome you to closing night of New Directors, New Films. Um, we've had a wonderful 12 days, and I'm glad that you can all be here with us um, for our final evening. Um, first of all, I do, I want to thank um, the supporters of New Directors, New Films, Kenneth Kuchin, the Junior Associates of the Museum of Modern Art, the New Wave Young Patrons Group of the Film Society, the New York Times, American Airlines, and Stella Artois, and also thanks to our hotel sponsor, Dream New York, and also um, on this closing night, a special thanks um, for the uh, sponsors of Closing Night, Patron Spirits, and the New Wave Group. Um, we have, uh, I work with um, my colleagues on the selection committee, a wonderful group of people, and I just do want to mention them again because um, we work really hard. So in addition to me, um, the selection committee is composed of uh, Yuta Jensen from MoMA, Robert Kohler, Rajendra Roy from MoMA, Josh Siegel from MoMA, and Gavin Smith uh, from here at the Film Society. It's wonderful uh, working with um, all of them. And our shorts committee, uh, Sophie Cavalacos, Marcelo Goglio, and Issa Cucinata. Um, they do a terrific job. So. Um, it's just, it's just great to work with them all. Also, um, we have a lot of filmmakers who are here this evening, our new directors, filmmakers, who've been with us. Um, they've actually connected with each other very much this year, and I find that very exciting. And a lot of them are here in the room, and I want to thank all of you for bringing your work here and being here to talk about your film over the past 12 days. It's just been wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes, you, please. That is why we do this. But we're not done. We have one more film, our Nixon. Um, New Directors began in 1972, the year that Richard Nixon won a re-election in a landslide, and also the year that Watergate changed from being just the name of a hotel to a scandal, and now just a buzzword. So it's a very fitting thing that we should end our uh, series this year with this wonderful documentary, Our Nixon. Um, so I'm very happy to bring the filmmakers up on the stage to introduce the film to you, and I'm very happy to bring up to the stage the directors of Our Nixon, Penny Lane and Brian L. Fry. Here they come. So let's read. Uh, hey, everybody. So there's a million things you can do with your time. I know that you've given us a couple hours of your time, and for that, we're very grateful. Brian, did you want to say a yeah, quick thing? Thank you so much for coming. We're, we're really excited to be here. Yes, and so everything in the film is uh, archival and found, which means that uh, everything in the film that you'll see is something that we located in the historical record, which is kind of an interesting fact. Otherwise, stick around for the Q&A, which is always interesting. Thank you. Let me, let me start by asking you about the title, which is playfully provocative, Our Nixon. <laughs> it occurred to me watching this that, unless I'm mistaken, neither of you was, and both of you were barely born during the Nixon uh, presidency. Brian was in utero. I was Brian, not born yet. Brian was in utero and you weren't born yet. So what, what does this suggest in terms of your responsibilities as filmmakers and also your mindfulness, if any, toward who your, your audiences are, especially mm -hmm. with somebody as polarizing as Nixon. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll start. Well, first of all, the title was Brian's title. I'm terrible at titles. Good title, Brian. Um, and we thought of it as being a play on two things. One was our Hitler, the Sieberberg film, which we thought was funny, particularly because people love to bring up Hitler in, in like the same sentence as Nixon, which I think is a little crazy, but that's OK. But that points to that what you were getting at, which I'll mention bef after. But the other play that we thought was kind of fun was our gang, the little rascals. And there was just kind of like this kind of like friendly, goofy brotherhood feeling that we thought that that title kind of conveyed. But as far as, um, yeah, we came to the film with a lot of distance. I mean, for better or worse, you know, we didn't have a, a strong, emotional, or even ideological um, feeling about this subject, about Richard Nixon's presidency. Um, we came to it as people of students of history, as people who live today, who thought that this home movie material was 
amazing and, and said a lot of things that we'd never thought about before. And so as people who'd kind of grown up with a certain narrative handed to us of the Nixon presidency, the home movies kind of didn't fit, I think, the narrative that we'd been handed. So there was a tension and an irony from the very beginning that came from the nature of the home movies kind of operating on a scale from banal, like really boring, to um, adorable. That seemed like it was just um, ripe with irony for, for this subject. Did you want to say anything else about that? Sure. I mean, just briefly, too, I would say that um, we intended the, the subject of the pronoun to be a little bit indefinite. So in some sense, it was our Nixon in the sense of the Nixon who was experienced by Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Chapin. Um, but we also thought of that as being kind of the Nixon exper experienced by his kind of self-created silent majority, all those people who voted for Nixon in 1972 um, who were betrayed by him and how that affected their own experience of um, you know, what he stood for and what they thought America stood for. Barbara, I wanted to ask you what sorts of memories this brings back for, um, in terms of your experiences covering the Nixon administration. You not only interviewed Haldeman, but you were given pride of place next to Nixon in China. And uh, so could you comment on any of that? Well, first of all, I found this fascinating because um, the material was not new to me, but I had forgotten so much of it. And I remember, for example, interviewing Bob Haldeman. He kept his room frigid and had a fire going all the time. And I thought, there's that fire. <laughs> um, I went w and I, I did the first um, interview that Henry Kissinger ever did in television. I had to explain who he was and what the accent was. And I remember saying uh, something, at that time he was seeing a lot of women. That was, I thought, a <laughs> wonderful part of all these glamorous women. And I said, people are you know, uh, uh, talking about this and they're, uh, they're considering, you know, they're, they're beginning to find you fascinating and sexy. And he said, I love it. Now when I bore people, they think it's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing uh, that, because you, you captured so much that I didn't know. I went on the China trip, and it was like going to Mars. Uh, it was absolutely extraordinary. Everybody in their Mao outfit, you couldn't tell the men from the women. Uh, I, I had somebody with me, each of us had somebody with us. All she was interested in was my age. Um, <laughs> I guess because I had lipstick on, and maybe we looked two minutes younger than the rest of them. Um, but it was also a time, and it, it's, you don't have time to go into this, uh, but Mrs. Nixon, mm -hmm. finally, you know, he was called Tricky Dick. Um, you're also young, you probably don't remember. He was Tricky Dick, and she was Plastic Pat. And she was made fun of, I mean, w when you think of the role of our First Lady today and other First Lady, uh, uh, she, it, it, she wasn't reviled, she was neglected. And when she went to China, suddenly she bloomed and they all talked about her, her red coat. She did not wear a fur coat. And the Chinese loved her, and she went to the schools with the little kids, and she became a person, and she came back to America, and she finally had a chance to be herself and to have people know her, mm -hmm. and her husband resigned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanna ask one other question. Um, Obviously, to be a good interviewer, you have to have a good bullshit detector and to know when you're being played. And I wonder if you had that feeling at all since you were interviewing these people, very, these cabinet members, uh, very early on, or if you actually didn't have that sense I'm that sorry. you were being that you were being played at all. Did you ever feel that interviewing? Kissinger well, you always are. You know, there's always a question, and, and I, so many of you, I'm sure, here are journalists. Uh, who's helping who? I mean, we're getting the interview, we're going after, why are you doing that interview? Because you asked me to, you know. Um, so were they playing us for their own purposes? Yes, but so are we. And Haldeman in particular was so elusive that to get an interview with him was a very big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when he was taking all of these pictures when we were in China. Um, my role in part in China was to buy gifts for Henry Kissinger's girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> and he was seeing, uh, you know, when Henry, if, if Dr. Kissinger hears about this, he will never forgive him. Oh. So you all have to not say a word, promise. <laughs> Cone of silence, Walter Reed Theater. Um, 
Nancy Kissinger, who at that point now, of course, Henry Kissinger goes very often to China and is much revered there uh, and has written a book on it. But at that point, Nancy was so against the communists that she would not allow Dr. Kissinger to buy anything for her because she didn't want anything from the communists. We forget what our feeling was about them when we went to China. It was not, isn't this wonderful and here we are and these are our friends. It was these people who were this much away from being our enemies. And I think, and I probably now uh, travel more than I ever want to again, but I, I, it was the most fascinating foreign country you could have been on a different planet. Um, and Nixon did it, and Henry Kissinger did it. And when I look at, at his downfall and, and what happened to him, we forget um, how good he was in foreign policy and what he did, and we, we see all of the bad and all of the, the tricky dick, and you, you did manage, I think, to convey both the part of the man that really was in many ways a very good president, mm -hmm. and the, the more we see other presidents, I, I don't know if you feel this way when you looked at all the archival material, but the more you realize how much he knew about foreign policy, and he did inherit the Vietnam War, and he, he, he deserves maybe a better reputation than we have given him. Interesting. It seems to me you don't make a home movie unless you want it to be seen. And one of the paradoxes of this film is the obsession with privacy and secrecy is in some sense in conflict, whether consciously or unconsciously, with the Nixon's need for, what you capture actually quite beautifully, Nixon's constant need for reassurance. What does the public think? What do my fellow cabinet members think? Mm -hmm. That constant need for reassurance has to do with his public image, right? And it seems to me, it, it one, when you said you saw them filming in China, I'm wondering what do you imagine they intended to do with this footage? Two of the three who shot it were admin, after mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, we know from historical records that they would show it to their friends. You know, you you went to China in 1972. That was a big deal. So yeah, you filmed so that you could. This is like a thing we don't really do anymore. But this is a thing people used to do. They would invite their friends over for a dinner party and bore them with their home movies. That's what they did with them. That's what the purpose was. That you know, and they certainly had an. They had at least Haldeman thought that there was a historical value to the footage. I mean, he was he was the obsessive documenter. He wrote everything down every day. He did audio diaries every night. He filmed everywhere he went. And so, yeah, he knew that there would be some moments he'd capture that might be historically valuable, but it, it wasn't, you know, a kind of, uh, it was really naive. It, it wasn't like, this is for the news and we're going to spin this, you know, at least from what we've read. Right. I mean, <clears throat> we've referred to them on occasion as the original oversharers. Um, and I think in some sense, like a social media metaphor can almost be helpful. I yeah. mean, <clears throat> they thought that the stuff that they were preserving was stuff that they would be in a position to curate and share with their friends or within a, like a small closed circle of people. And they had every reason to believe that. I mean, prior to Nixon, everything produced by the White House staff was the property, the personal property of the president. Um, and so it, you know, it took, a, a, it took a, a, a law to change that. I mean, the government actually took that material away from Nixon and ultimately had to had to compensate the Nixon estate for that. So they, I mean, in retrospect, it looks naive to think that you know you could record all this stuff and that people wouldn't have access to it. But at the time, it was actually a perfectly reasonable assumption for them to make, or at least that you know they would decide what became part of the historical record and what didn't. Can I just say something about Nixon, the man, having interviewed him many times and seeing him, and what he would have done <coughs> if he was sitting here? He was so awkward. I, I, I'm sure when you went through the material. You, because you have the, the speeches, right? I mean, he was a very awkward <laughs> man and would take things over. And did, did you find that? It, it, it's, it's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that didn't end up in the film, but sure. it's, th we, w as we were sort of figuring out how to in incorporate these, these conversations, um, it, it developed into a theme and sort of uh, the conversations that he has with Haldeman, not just emblematic of who he is as a person, but also seeing how gradually he sort of You left out sight. the four letter words. <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> but also, he wanted so much to be liked. I don't know whether you, you got, you know, you saw that when you were looking. He, if you were doing an interview with him, it, when I was, he would comment, 
uh, just to sort of show that he was one of the guys, he would, he would comment on my scarf or my boots, I, it, just to have a, uh, to show that he was a friendly guy, which he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And if he would, <laughs> if he was doing an interview, he would tell dirty jokes to the cameraman, to the crew. I mean, there was such a need to be accepted, and he wasn't at all. Um, and again, when I think of, of his awkwardness, and I, I think of her, because Pat Nixon, to me, is one of the, the most interesting first ladies because she was considered so uninteresting. Mm -hmm. And her life was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Her children have written about her, Julie has written about her, and so forth. But if he was sitting here now with all of you, he would tell a dirty joke. <laughs> There's, there's a funny anecdote that didn't make the film. Maybe you, either one of you can uh, recollect it better than I can, but there was a line that Ehrlichman had about a president being like a racehorse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a great like, little bit of an interview Ehrlichman did once where he talked about how he was, he was trying to explain to some interviewer how, yes, we all think Nixon is so weird, but a, lar a large part of that is because we've heard all these tapes. I mean... Do you think presidents are normal people? Any of them? I don't know. Maybe some of them are. I don't know. I've never met any presidents. But what Ehrlichman said was that he used but a metaphor. What we have now is fairly normal. Yeah, fairly normal compared to Nixon. Okay. Um, he, he used the metaphor of the racehorse. Like, so, you know, you're gro you said it's not a normal horse. It's a horse that's only been groomed to win this one particular race, right? Like, it's just the race to become president and then the race to stay president. And so you lose all normal horse stuff. You don't go, like, frolic in the pasture and, like, you know, flirt with the girl horses. You just are this one thing. I, I believe it was you wouldn't invite him over to play a board game. Yeah. Sounds like the beginning of a dirty joke. <laughs> um, a twister. I want to actually ask you a question, but it's it's perhaps for all three of you. Um, Bruce Connor, who was a f master practitioner of, of archival footage filmmaking, famously said, I only own the splices, by which he meant he didn't shoot the footage, but the decisions he made to juxtapose certain images or certain sounds were entirely his own and that each juxtaposition was both a, an artistic act and a political act. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could comment on your own curating of the footage and also whether you felt somehow that since every act in this case is a political act in the way that you juxtapose images, you felt that kind of weight on you every time you made a decision on what to keep in, what to keep out, what to put. Uh, I think definitely, I mean, we, we felt a very strong need to ensure that everything in the film was as true as we could make it and maintained a fidelity to the historical record. We didn't want to falsify anything or give a false impression uh, to the extent that we could prevent it. And of course, you know, making a movie sometimes requires choices that may not be literally accurate, but convey as much of the you know, relevant information as, as possible. So I'd say like one interesting example is when Nixon gives the silent majority speech and it's followed by a discussion of his speech, you know, we sort of give the impression that they're talking about the silent majority speech, which is not in fact true, although it's not explicitly stated in the film. But the, uh, we, we felt, we, we struggled with that decision because we weren't sure that that was appropriate. Um, right, because that speech we took out of order. Like right. that's, you know, the film progresses chronologically, but if any Nixon people in the room, they'll yeah. know the silent majority speech was way earlier than the rest of this stuff. Right. And we, we didn't want to give anyone the room to say like, you're manipulating us yeah. and you're lying and, mm -hmm. you know. But we felt that the silent majority speech was just a much better speech to convey the kind of issues that Nixon was trying to confront. Um, and that the conversation was most emblematic of the relationship between Haldeman and Nixon. And so we, we felt that it was a reasonable compromise, even though it wasn't literally historically. I was wondering if Francisco would talk about this. So we came to you with like a really crappy edit, right? Some of the film was in yeah. place, and it was just a crappy edit, and Francisco <laughs> saved us. But this idea of the splices, do you want to talk about that? Like how you helped us develop a voice for the film without having literally the voice of the filmmaker? Sure. Um, I mean, there's a, w the, the most radical difference in the version that uh, Penny and, and Brian had been working on when it came to me and, um, you know, what happened since was the inclusion of these posthumous interviews that were given after um, the three men were released from prison, you know, over ensuing decades. They were public figures and they were semi-recurring um, figures in talk shows and things of that sort. Um, and for us, 
it became very clear that because um, these are Super 8 films, they generally don't have sync sound, they're not talking uh, to you through their footage, they're talking to you from the, the experience of looking back on all, on all that happened. And so that sort of enforces the nostalgia, but it also allowed us to populate the film with the, with the main characters. And in addition to, you know, give them an arc. You know, um, for us, it's, it's a political film, certainly. It, it can't not be a political film, but we came to a, a very uh, clear conclusion early on. Maybe, I, I think certainly before even the film came to me, but I, I had to come to the conclusion myself that this wasn't going to be a Watergate film. It's a film about three men looking at the, the presidency from sort of the backstage or the side stage perspective. Um, and they all come at, they all came out of it, you know, very different men. Um, and that comes through on its own um, in their interviews, but simply by, by what they choose to film, you know, they're, they're filming birds, they're filming each other goofing off. They're, they're filming in China. They, they recognize certainly that was a historical event. There's a lot of things that also aren't in the film. Um, so part of it, you know, as far as stylistically how we tr retreated the footage was to keep it um, whenever possible as close to the, you know, fly, you know, fly by night, rickety, super eight home movies that they are. And was, it, was it all, all of those birds and things, was that all Halderman's that was Ehrlichman. And, that was, and Ehrlichman. was he talking over it, or he was just taking pretty pictures? Pretty pictures. So all the, all the bird stuff was Ehrlichman, who was a great burger. Great burger. Um, uh, we paired the sort of shots through the White House office mm -hmm. windows with a lot of those telephone conversations to kind of create the idea of someone sitting at their desk on the phone looking out the window, which some people maybe don't get, but that was it's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that uh, I'm, I, I hope is interesting no, to please. you, uh, and, and was to me, was to see at Chapin and how much he had changed. Yeah. The others hadn't changed, they were older, but they had, he is unrecognizable, that young, cute guy. And <laughs> I thought that was so interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about that, but yes, it, it is interesting. <laughs> well, he was. We well, because saw him when we were as, a young, as a young Right, kid. oh, and he was this and like then, hot and then, bad and man and then guy. The old, the older, I mean, you know. Yeah, no, well, and when we were watching the Super 8 home movies initially, which was the first thing we did, we didn't start with looking at secondary sources. We literally just got the home movies and spent about a month at Yaddo, at an artist residency, just looking at them. And we didn't know who we were looking at, but I kept saying, who's that guy? He's so cute. And um, I never thought that I was going to have that response. So that was one of the earliest surprises for me, was like, oh my god, some of these guys are really good looking. They ran out of Mad Men. Larry, Larry Higby has a lot of fans among the ladies <laughs> when we presented. <laughs> I first heard about this collection of Super 8 films uh, from Bill Brand, who um, uh, was an old friend of mine. He's a teacher at Hampshire College and also someone who does film preservation for NARA. And so he told me about the movies because he was working on the preservation project uh, in, on a car ride up to Hampshire and uh, was kind enough to show me a couple reels of, uh, of work print as he was working on the material. And it really um, blew me away because I had a long standing interest in amateur film and, and home movies. Uh, but the, the material just wasn't really available and I didn't have any money at the time. So I wrote a short article for, for Cineast and kind of told people about it. I was like, wouldn't it be cool to get a hold of this material? I'd really love to do something with it, but it would cost too much money, basically. And then I, many years later, I met Penny actually at the Flaherty Film Seminar and I told her about the Nixon home movies, and she said, well, if you don't make that movie, <laughs> I'm gonna make that movie, so we better collaborate so I don't have to steal it from you. Um, <coughs> and uh, we went ahead and essentially sight unseen, because I'd seen about 15 or 20 minutes of the home movies. And it was thir 30 hours, about 30, 30 hours yeah. of the home so, movies. So uh, essentially sight unseen, we paid for the National Archives to make the first uh, ever video transfer of the material uh, with our fingers crossed that um, there would be a movie in there. And, um, and as Penny was alluding to earlier, th the film really came out of the home movies rather than being something we tried to impose on them. I mean, we just asked, after looking at the movies, what kind of film do these want to be, yeah. right? I mean, what kind of story do they tell? We didn't really know. I mean, part of me was hoping it would be a story that was more about Nixon. Right, like and more intimate time with Nixon And it's or really something. not, right? I mean, they weren't filming when they were in Nixon's office. They were more focused on the president at that point. They're far, they, they film when they're bored right, or when they're on vacation, or when they're seeing something cool. So uh, the film was really more about them, and we realized that immediately, that it had to be, because that was the only story that the Super 8 films wanted to tell. Right, and we could see right away, like this 
this, you guys saw it, like it's like this sort of um, the world before Watergate, right? It, be, it was almost like um, the Kodachrome Oz in reverse or something. Like it was so clear that they thought they were part of this story that they ended up not being a part of. Um, that the story was going to be, this is the greatest presidency ever. Um, and you see that. You see that in what they film and how they look and what they're doing. How, and they, how they talk about what Yeah, and so and before we even heard their voices, though, we, we felt that from the home movies. And so and it was also really obvious that you couldn't do a kind of like exhaustive compilation film about the Nixon presidency because the home movies were so limited. It was just always from like the wrong angle. Like, you know, like if you want a good sort of standard B-roll of the Nixon presidency, this stuff's totally useless. It's like shaky and out of focus and it's like not with the lights and they're really bad shooters. And, you know, so, you know, so it, 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 it almost can't function. You know, you, Francisco struggled with this a lot. Like we had to use it as B-roll in a lot of cases and it was tough. It was tough to find shots that were good. <laughs> the good enough to just be sort of clear, like what are you looking at? So it always had to be about the people holding the cameras. There was no other film that it could have been. Of course, there is, there is a, a lot more great stuff. Obviously they didn't make it into the movie and uh, very soon we're gonna be uploading all of the material to archive.org so anyone who wants to use it can. Some of that, and Penny can take the rest. So um, I'm actually a, a law professor by profession. Um, so I do have some background in American history. I'm not a PhD, but I studied legal. Yeah, but I, I studied You're legal fired. history mostly, actually, um, from the founding era. But I, you know, some passing familiarity. We became, I think, relatively. Uh, I would say uh, Nixon buffs in the context of making this film. I wouldn't call myself a historian of the Nixon presidency, but. We, sh we certainly read a lot of secondary sources as well as really spending a lot of time with the, uh, with the primary sources. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so what was okay, so the other question was about um, our relationship to the Nixon Presidential Library. Yes, we spend a lot of time at the Nixon Presidential Library. Ryan Pettigrew, the AV archivist, was amazing, and I can give him one specific shout out that you can all be thankful for, which is we said to him when we got there, What's the one thing you have in the audiovisual archives that you're shocked no other filmmaker has ever used? Basically, and he said, "What's the coolest? What's thing the coolest here? thing you have that no one's used?" And he was like, "This." And it was that Ray Conniff singer's protest. And it was like, "I can't believe this." <laughs> and he's been saying that for years. He's like, "Why doesn't anyone? What, this is amazing, you know." And it was. So he handed us that. That was day one. Oh yes, that was really the song they sang. Yes, it was. That was what's so great about it. Is it's like really funny, and then it's funny all over again when they start singing because we didn't know who the right kind of singers were, but we were like, that's what it is. Okay, and then the other question was about what our plans are. So yeah, our plans are to release the film really widely. We have a lot of things happening right now. We can't announce it yet, but the film will be distributed soon. We have another audience waiting to come in, so I hope you can just uh, leave the theater quickly. But I want to thank all of the participants. Woo!